this whole this whole week, uh, you know, when you spend time searching the scriptures and, and time trying to find out what, what it is God's trying to reveal to you, when you, when you spend time doing these things, uh, and, and He begins to to, to give you a message, uh, you just like, oh wow, <laughs> I didn't see that. And, and and I was I was talking in Bible study Wednesday night how. You can just take a little, a couple words, a couple words of a verse, or, or the whole verse, and you can look at that. And you can look at it on the surface to see what it means on the surface. And then God gives you this, 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 this thought process, and all of a sudden you see a couple other verses that might match to it, and then you, you add those couple verses to it. And all of a sudden you go a little deeper in your understanding and meaning of what God's trying to say to you. And then he gives you a passage, and then he gives you more and more and more. And so the depths of the scripture just keep building and keep building and keep building. And it's, it's so amazing to me the things that God will reveal. I was talking to my wife, and I was saying that it, it amazes me. The, the, the one little thing I got out of the book of John, and I was talking to Calvin Clark the other day about this. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is just... This blows my mind because the book of John takes four Jewish men, Peter, James, Andrew, and John, and, and it introduces them as his first disciples. And they want to follow me. He says, I'll make you fishers of men. I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me. And they follow him. And then it says, Jesus found Andrew. Oh, excuse me, Jesus found Philip. And Philip was... Uh, uh, likely a half Greek, half Jewish man. He 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 probably had a a, a Jewish father, uh, a, a, excuse me, a Greek father and a Jewish mother, much like Timothy. And so he, he and he and but he was following the the Jewish uh, religion. But Jesus went and found him, and then it says Philip went and found Nathaniel, Bartholomew, Nathaniel. And Nathaniel was this, this perfect Jew to Jesus. Jesus says, oh, look, a true, a true man, in him there's no deceit. He found a, a true Jewish man. And I want, you to, uh, I want you to see what I saw. I saw the gospel. I saw the plan of God right there in the, that, just the gathering of those first six disciples, that he went to the Jew first. He took the, the, the gospel, the, the, the promises of God, and he gave them to the Jews first. And the Jews... Didn't, the Jews rejected him, and we'll, find, we'll see that from this point on in John, how the Jewish people re rejected him. Then he went to the Gentile. He went to the Philip. He went to the, the Gentile nation. And the Gentile nation came in, and the Gentile nation went out and, and, and preached the gospel and fulfilled the, the calling of God, and Nathaniel was found. And Nathaniel became this perfected Jew, or this completed Jew, who is now a believer in Jesus Christ, and that's the plan of the gospel. That's the very plan that's in this gospel. And when I saw that, I went, oh, wow, Lord, are you kidding me? You just showed me this. Because it was amazing to me how when you go deep and deep and deep, and it's the, the, the consistency of God's word and what he's revealing to you is over and over again. In, in Romans, if you turn to Romans really fast, and we look, look, look at Romans 11, it talks about this very thing. You know, Jesus does not uh, identify true saving faith by its perfection. He doesn't define or see true saving faith by its perfection. No, by its affection. That it's our affection that he sees our, his, our true saving faith in that. So when we look at in Romans 11, starting in verse 25, he says, For I do not want you, to, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. So he's, talking, he's talking to the Romans. He's talking to the, the Gentile nation, the people who are coming... This is the church of, of Rome. He's saying to them, I don't want you to be uh, uninformed about this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. He says, the partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Just as it's written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove the ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins that he will remove the ungodliness from Jacob, that, that the house of Jacob has, <laughs> they, they've just left God over and over and over again. They, they worshipped idols. They did all these things that God commanded his chosen people. 
the house of Jacob, Israel, not to do. They, he, they kept doing it. And he says, I'm going to remove that uncleanliness from Jacob. He says, from that, the standpoint of the gospel, there are enemies for your sake. That the, the gospel of Christ, the, the good news, the New Testament, the good news of Christ Jesus, the gospel, it's, 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 there are enemies of it. That's the, they, they reject the gospel of Jesus. And it's, it's for the sake of the Gentiles. But from the standpoint of God, the standpoint of God's choices, they are beloved for the sake of their fathers. They have received a promise of inheritance. That God has set them aside until the fullness of times, until the fullness of the Gentiles. For the gifts of the calling are, are, uh, of God are, are irrevocable. That you can't, God doesn't say, well, yeah, I promise you that, but I, I changed my mind. I'm not going to do that anymore. He just doesn't do that. But that promise to the Jews, the Jewish nation has to be fulfilled. But it's the setting aside of the Jewish nation that he called in the Gentiles. And it's called the church age. It's the age we're in right now that we live in a church age where he's calling us to the unified body of Christ until the church becomes that unified body of Christ. That's why we, we, we talk about love, our brother. We, we talk about bringing the kingdom of heaven here on earth that we're going to love one another because that's God's, that's God's desire of his children. That's God's desire of his people. That's God's desire of his chosen people in Christ Jesus. And it's an amazing thing when you stop and look at how God has, has made this. And we talked about the manifold wisdom of God, how he's taken these things and put them all together to what? To glorify him. We're here to glorify God that in our actions and who we are and the things that we do in Christ, those glorify God. Every time we do something that, that is uh, a giving of ourselves, is, is not seeing ourselves as more important, but giving ourselves to somebody else, that glorifies God. And the angels in heaven rejoice, and they glorify God over it. And that's what God is looking for. He's, he says that... that uh, that we're a people or a child of his to his glory. What an amazing God we serve. You know, God offered the Son of Man to the chosen people of Israel, and they rejected him. And we, we talked about that last week, how this group of people from, from where Jesus had, was uh, dining with Mary, Martha, Joseph, and Simon and his disciples were this group of people that saw the, the raising of Lazarus where they gathered around. They started going up to Jerusalem with Jesus. And then the multitude of people that heard about this, they all came out because they were coming out to honor this king, this, this conqueror of Rome, this man who was going to conquer Rome and deliver them back to a sovereign nation. So they got this a million people coming in to, to Jesus and they're all surrounding him. They're palm leaves and they're laying their coats on the ground and they're, they're honoring him as the king, a conqueror. This man is going to conquer Rome and Jesus weeps. Jesus looked over the city of Jerusalem. He looked over the temple and wept because he knew that these very people that were honoring him, that were, that were giving him all this praise and all this glory, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He wept because he knew those same people five days later were going to say, crucify him. Crucify him because they're going to reject him. And he knows that and he weeps about that. He weeps about what's going to happen. When, 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 when we see the, 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 the gospel of Christ. Who, who's, who's the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Great I Am, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lord? When we see Him coming, we have to see Him coming for the right reasons. The people wanted this conqueror, and they didn't want spiritual health. They didn't want spiritual renew newness, renewness. They didn't want that. You know, would you agree with me that everyone, everyone you know, wants to be loved and to know that somebody cares about them? Would you, would you, uh, let me ask you this. When you look around, when you look around, what do you see? What do you see when you look around? When you're still, what do you hear? When you just stop and take a deep breath in, what do you feel? You know, the presence of God 
is here. Right now. God is eternal. He's here right now. In our hearts. In our minds. In our thoughts. We stop and we go breathe in. We're breathing in that breath of life that He's given us. When you think of God, that man that, that He sent as His Son, as our Redeemer, our Savior, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel? Those who have eyes to hear, uh, eyes to see, let them see. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. He's right here. For two or more gathered in His name, there He is among us. Do you see God that way? Do you see it that way? When you just, He says in Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. Because He's there with you. He's always there with you. He says, open your eyes and see me. Open your ears and hear me. Return your heart to me. Return to me and I'll return to you. This is the God that we serve. This is the God who created us. This is the God who sent His Son. This is the God who gave us all in all. This is the God. This is the, we sing about the Savior Jesus, who is God in the flesh. We sing about Him and praise His name and, 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 and love to serve and honor Him. When we see our God that way, that when I move through life, He is with me. When I see it in that understanding, gosh, the things that He'll tell you, the way He will lead you is amazing. Just amazing. Just amazing. So, in, in Romans 2, Twelve, or excuse me, in John 12, starting in verse 20, the, the Pharisees just said, look around you. The whole world's coming to them. And then this, this what, some, what some authors say is out of place text, and I don't see this out of place. I see this such a beautiful text here because it's talking about you. And it's talking about me. It's talking about all those found in Christ. It says, now, there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship the, the, at the feast. These, these then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. These, these, these Jewish men, excuse me, these Greek men who, 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 became, uh, who were, took, took on the Jewish religion to go and worship at the festival, the Passover, came to Philip. Now, they came to Philip because Philip was part Greek. He was from Bethsaida which is, of Galilee, which is near Decapolis. So these Greek people, they, they, they identified themselves as somebody that could speak to Philip. Philip was open, able to listen, able to hear. He was doing what God called him to do. He had an open heart to receive anybody that wanted to, to know Christ. And Philip takes him and says... And it says, sir, we wish to see Jesus, or we wish to meet Jesus, sir. I don't know what your Bible particularly says, but what that word should say is we wish to experience Jesus. We wish to, to, to take heed of Jesus. We wish to know him. This is what the true Greek says, is that we wish to experience this man. So Philip, it says, Philip came and he told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. They say that, 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 that there's a, an outer court where the Gentiles can only go to, and they can't go into this inner court where only the Jewish people can go to. So it was probably happened out at that place, and they went into that inner court where Jesus was likely teaching or talking to, to the, the crowds around them. And Jesus said, The hour has come. For the Son of Man to be glorified. To be glorified. Think about that. He, all through His ministry, He said, My hour has not come. My hour has not come. It's not time for me to go do this. It's not time for the Son of Man to be glorified yet. It's not time for the Son of Man to be glorified. What does it mean to you be glorified? To be magnified? I mean, that is, that is a word that is so really undescribable. To be glorified in something. 
He says it's now time for the Son of Man to be glorified. Why does he say the Son of Man? He calls himself, he gave that title to himself, the Son of Man, because he's responding to the, to the prophecy that's in Daniel 7, where it says, I saw in the darkness on a, riding on a horse the Son of Man appearing in a cloud. That in Daniel 7, there's a prophecy about, the, 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 it says in, in, in verse 11 that the, the, uh, the great beast was slain, and that the Son of Man came. And this is the Son of Man that he's referring to. He's letting the Jewish people know that he's the Messiah. He's the promised one. He's the promised one from the, from the prophet Daniel. See, the prophet Daniel was a big prophet to the Jewish people. That's their, that's their go-to prophet on so much of their stuff because it talks about the end times. It talks about the future. So these people, these Jewish nation, would know what he's talking about. Is I'm the Son of Man. He gives, gives himself that title. And the people, are, they, they know what he's saying. He's saying that he's the promised one. But these people have such a small view. They're living in a world that's just beat them down to give them a small view of who God is. So they see the Son of Man as just this man that's going to come conquer. But it says it's time for the Son of Man to be glorified, to be magnified. To be that the, the deification, the, the magnification of God is going to occur. That, that the Son of Man is about to be glorified. He, he's not just going to die. He's going to die. He's going to be buried. He's going to be resurrected to show His divine power. A power only God has. God will show the proof positive. He will show the people proof positive. By his actions on the cross, by his march to death, and by his resurrection, that this is no ordinary man. That's God going to glorify the Son of Man. He's going to be glorified. Make no mistake, Jesus was affirming to the people, he is who was prophesied in Daniel 7, that he will conquer the present day ruler. He will conquer the present-day ruler of Satan. He will conquer the present-day ruler of your heart, death. He will conquer that on the cross. He would came to conquer death, but he came to first conquer it in your hearts. You have to believe. He came to conquer death in your heart, in your knowing, in your inner man, in who you are, that you see that. He said it's time for the Son of Man to be glorified. He knows what's happening in five days. He knows about his death, burial, and resurrection. He knows how God's going to take, be glorified from that. It says in verse 24, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, or amen, amen, or this is so important, hold on to this. This is an important statement I'm fixing to tell you. I don't, say, I don't think you said fix it. I'm going to use it anyways. <laughs> Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it, hears, it bears much fruit. He's saying that unless he dies and is buried, he can't bear, he can't bear much fruit. He's talking about when he dies and he's buried and then he's resurrected, he grows again. That he's going to bear much fruit that out of the fruit of the cross, the, 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 the planting of Jesus in the ground and the, and the cross, the death and burial on the cross, and, it, and being resurrected, that's going to bear much fruit. Look around at his fruit. <laughs> Look around at his people. Look around at the fruit he's been bearing for 2,000 years. My gosh, he's bore, bore so much fruit, but here he calls us to die to ourselves. He calls us to die to who we are in the world. He calls us to take and shake off the dust of the world and to live in Christ, to, to be a disciple of His. He tells us to die to ourselves, be buried and be renewed, have a new life in Him. And when you do, you'll bear much fruit. Gosh, I've seen that. I've seen that. Look at Billy Graham. Look at all these great pastors, Spurgeon. 
I, I, these great pastors that, that lived over time that just completely emptied themselves and humbled themselves and grew so many people in Christ. They didn't grow them in Billy Graham. They grew them in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They grew them as disciples of Christ. That was the fruit they bore. That's the fruit you're called to bear. He says, he who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. Eternal. Have you ever stopped to think what the word eternal means? Have you ever stopped to think what eternity looks like? What eternity feels like? The first thing you have to understand is in, in eternity, there is no time. There is no tick, 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 marching down. It's eternal. It's everlasting. It's forever. It's eternity. He's saying that you will have life eternal. Life eternal. But you gotta, you got to hate your life in this world. You got to love your life in Christ. He says in verse 26 if anyone, not just you, Hunter, not just you, Schaefer, Jim, but if anyone serves me, he must follow me. He must follow me. What does that mean to follow Christ? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? See, one who serves, the word serves here is used as an armor bearer. One who bears arm, the armor for the great warrior, for the great king. The kings had armor bearers and wherever they went, this armor bearer went with them. He served that king. He was ready to fight alongside the king. He was ready to clothe him in his armor and give him the, 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 the ability to go fight. Because he, he was his armor bearer. He, it didn't matter what dangers, what things were. He was going to serve his king. He was going to be right there beside him at all costs. That was the armor bearer. That's the word used here for serves. He who serves, he, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. That means I've got to carry my full armor of God always and follow hard after Christ. That I, mean, I need to follow, the, follow him and how he leads me. How he's driving me through my day. How he's taking me in a path of righteousness. How he's taking me in a path towards glory. How I'm being able to be glorified by who I am in Christ. That I must serve a righteous king of kings. That I'm willing to bear that armor. That I'm willing to serve that king. I've got to follow that. Christ didn't, ask, didn't, Christ didn't ask you to sit around and just listen to him. He didn't ask you to just, just come occasionally and say, hey, dude, how you doing? He, didn't, he doesn't want you just on, on a every once in a while basis. In your morning, when you wake up, he wants to hear you. He wants you to say, here you go, yes, Lord. What do you have for your servant today? He wants to hear you when you're struggling and something. Yes, Lord, how are we doing this through today? What are we doing? How are we getting through this, Lord? Because I rely on you. You're my will. You're my way. You're my path to where I'm going. When you're, when you're driving down the road and that guy's going too slow in front of you, he goes, yes, Lord, I'm patient. <laughs> yes, Lord. What do you have for your servant today? All I have is yours. All I carry, everything I have, everything I have is yours, Lord. That's what he wants from us as servants of him, that we're to follow him. And he can use whatever I have to his glory, not to mine. Whatever I have is his, and he uses it because I'm following him, and I'm his servant. Do you see Jesus that way? Do you feel God with you? 
Do you, feel, do you hear God? Do you see Him? He says, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean the Father will honor him? What honor are you looking for in life? Are you looking for the honor of men? Are you looking for, for mankind to say, oh, what a great person he was? You know, when I do funerals, you can always tell the honor of a person by how many people show up at their funeral. I did a funeral five, six years ago. And besides me, there were seven other people there. And I, I had to preach a little bit of the good news. And I, and I had to share Christ with them. But, but this person wasn't honored by their family, honored by their friends, honored by the people who they had 82 years of life with. Seven people. I, I, I've done a funeral where there was hundreds of people gathered all around. Where it was such a joyous time, such a great time where we could sing praises to the Lord about this, great, this person's great life they had because God honored them because of who they were in Christ, because people loved that person because of how they were in Christ. But they loved that person because who they were in Christ because it showed those people that that person cared about them. That person loved them. That person wanted to, to do things for their interest because they were a servant of Christ. And they were honored for that. They were honored for that. What, a, what an amazing thing. And this... Neither of these two people were famous. <laughs> they were neither one were famous. But the flocks of people that came to, 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 the, to be, to pay respects to those people, it just, it was so impactful to me. It was so impactful to me because God honors those who serve Him. Isn't that amazing? The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth so that he may strongly support those whose eyes are turned towards him, whose heart is turned towards him, whose ears are turned towards him, whose life is turned towards him. The eyes of the Lord, the, the Lord will support, will honor those who honor him. Second half of that verse, that's one verse, that's Second Chronicles 16.9. If you haven't heard me say it yet, you're, I'm sorry. If you're new to this church, welcome to 2 Chronicles 16, 9. Love the verse, because it's a two-part verse. The second part says, because you did not do these things, from now on you'll have war. Because <laughs> you don't honor God, you're not going to have peace in your life. You're going to have war. You're going to struggle through life. You're going to struggle through the things of everyday life. You're not going to have a simple life in Christ. You're going to be battling the world. <laughs> that's, that's God talking to you. That's what the Lord says. You know, here's what, here's what the Lord put so heavily on my heart today. If you look, if you look for God in the things you do, you'll find Him. When you find Him, He'll reveal Himself to you. Amen? So, here's the thing. You have to look for God in every circumstance you're in, in every situation you're in, in every place you are, you have to look for God, and He'll reveal truth and love to you. I, not the Lord say that, but the Lord says that too. I promise you that if you just stop and be still, you'll hear the Lord. You'll hear God, that little, those little voices, little voice talking to you. Saying, here I am. Here I am. Die to yourself. Get out of the way. I love this thing. You just got to get over yourself. <laughs> it's the hardest thing to do. How do you get over yourself? No, God, 
God's given us, we sing songs. Who walks around with a song in their heart always? I do. I've always got a song in my heart. I walk around with a song in my heart, and I know by the song that I have in my heart what mood I'm in. <laughs> so I just turn on music loud and beat it into me. But I, 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 I listen to these, these, these songs all the time in my heart, and, and, I, and I know that when I'm walking around with a song in my heart, and it's a song of praise and worthiness and loving the Lord and a song of, 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 servant, of being a servant to Christ, man, I feel great. I'm uplifted. You know, it can be anywhere from Amazing Grace to the Old Rugged Cross to I Ran Out of That Grave. Oh, I mean, just the, all these songs that just pile into me. And I love it. And when I don't hear that song in my heart, I play the radio real loud. I play my Spotify real loud. The music that's going to help me return <coughs> to Christ. Spirit that's going to help me return to God. Because when I'm with God, when I'm in line with that plumb, with that plumb line, that cross, when I'm in line with that, oh, what a joy I feel. What a peace I have in life. Amen. And I can feel your presence here with